Well, live in Washington now is Elizabeth Obagi from the Institute for the Study of War. And with me in the studio are the French journalist Christine Ocrant and the writer and former British military officer Frank Ledwidge. Um, welcome to the programme, all of you. Frank Ledwidge, the, the <coughs> argument that's often used for doing more to arm the rebels in Syria is that essentially it's, it's a matter of levelling the playing field against a really fearsome army. Well, Michelle, it's, it's astounding that after the last decade of less than stellar performance in theatres of operations such as Iraq and Afghanistan that we're even considering this now. If there's one lesson that came out of those conflicts, it is that war is a political act. It requires political leadership, political support, and above all, political objectives. It requires alongside it, as we saw in Afghanistan, a political track that is entirely absent at the moment. Now, throwing arms at this rebel group or that rebel group uh, none of whom, which of course we fully understand, and many of the whom are directly linked with the people who've been fighting in places such as Iraq, seems to me a recipe for absolute disaster. So it would be completely wrong then to, to try and somehow bring stability to Syria by trying to level that playing field? Well, there's no stability to be had, save through a positive and aggressive engagement with negotiation, stopping this policy of almost deliberately antagonising uh, the Russians and the Chinese, and engaging in a ceasefire in pressure to, pro to, to promote Does this look like a, a government that's willing to negotiate with, with anyone, the government in Syria? Well, Karadzic in Bosnia didn't look like a government willing to negotiate. The Taliban certainly didn't. We should have negotiated with the Taliban a decade ago. The lesson from Bosnia and the lesson of diplomacy over the last decade or two is that you do not promote negotiations by setting unachievable preconditions. Let's, um, let, let's turn to Elizabeth Obagi, who's live with us from Washington. How do you see this debate about um, whether we can achieve something positive by arming the rebels in Syria? Well, I think one of the biggest problems has been the fact that whether the US or the international community decides they want to arm the opposition, other countries are already doing it. And disparate sources of funding going to the opposition has only created problems. It's led to the rise of extremism, it's led to the rise of Salafist groups, and it's led to internal rivalries that are literally breaking the social fabric of Syrian society. And to that degree, I think that it is important that the international community really take an international leadership position in terms of uh, weapon supplies as well as other support to the opposition. So are you saying that if you can't beat them, join them in the sense that if other countries aren't doing it, then it's time just to be realistic about it? I think there is a certain point at which we have to be realistic about what's going on on the ground. And there's a lot of denial going on, especially here in Washington and um, amongst the international community as a whole. And I think that it's very important to realize what is being done on the ground, especially in terms of our allies, in terms of Gulf countries and regional countries that have a very vested interest in this issue. And I think that there becomes a point when it does become necessary at which we need to step in and really ensure that what is happening is being done in a much more positive way and in ways that help build Caesarea society rather than tear it down. Well, let's take a, let's take a broader look now, um, if, we, if we may, about, um, about intervention, because um, Christine Ocrant, French journalist, is also with us. And of course, Christine, we look at all these interventions through the prism of what we've seen before. I remember so many of the same arguments, um, not necessarily the sectarian ones, but the similar arguments being used in Libya, for Libya, uh, where France was taking a lead on the intervention. Yes, but it, it's an entirely different picture. And I think what is needed is political leadership from Washington. And as long as there is none of that, except indeed a very decisive attitude from President Obama not to get caught up in the Syrian mess, uh, we Europeans don't know what to do. I think there's a, a great deal of uh, posture, a great deal of hypocrisy, you know, pondering what should we do. And at the same time, <coughs> sorry, it's a huge humanitarian disaster. We did intervene, the British and the French, in Libya because of Benghazi to, to prevent a massacre. But apparently, we didn't see through. It's not enough you know, to come over, and that was easy because Gaddafi had no air force, by the way. It's not only, you know, come over and then leave and yeah. let but the mess why, but, but why should the Syria is a different story. But why should the political leadership come from President Obama when it was Nicolas Sarkozy, French president at the time, who took the lead on Libya? Because I believe Syria has a much wider impact. It involves the whole Middle East. So and Libya so was far, easier, so Europeans two, can lead on Libya. Of course. 
And, and Obama was quite pleased to be leading from behind. That was, at the time, the Washington theory. You know, OK, let's lead, but from behind. Syria, for the time being, there are two clear winners. One is Mr. Putin, and the other one is the supreme guide in Iran, the supreme leader in Iran. Iran is calling the shots through the Hezbollah, through Hezbollah that indeed Assad was able to gain some military victories uh, over the past few weeks. And indeed, it's all part of that huge conflict between the Shia and the Sunni. Yeah. And, I, and, and I think our uh, Washington uh, f expert is absolutely right. As long as the Gulf states on the one hand, Saudi Arabia on the other, are, are giving weapons to various groups which no one really controls and, and which we Westerners have great difficulty in even identifying. Yeah. I think it's, uh, it's, you know, the more time passes by, the more, the more complicated it well, gets. Well, Elizabeth Obagia, I, I know that you know Syria very well and you know a, a lot of these different groups in Syria. Should we be making more effort then to, to not regard the Syrian rebels as one mass and trying to find uh, the groups with which, Syria, with which the West really feels comfortable? I actually think this is one of the largest problems is that when people look at the Syrian opposition, they tend to see it as a united entity. And unfortunately, because of the disparate sources of funding and the way that the conflict has carried on for so long and the course of events it has taken, unfortunately, it's just not a unified opposition. And so you do have to do the groundwork. You do have to engage with different elements of the opposition. And I think there are ways to identify who are the people that, are, that have similar interests to the West, who are the right players, who are the moderate, responsible actors that we could work with, and then work from there to identify those that we wouldn't be willing to work with. Frank Ledwich? Well, that, let's look at this from the tactical, the sort of military level. Assuming your arming doesn't work, the next cry, of course, will be for safe zones, which require, needless to say, no-fly zones. That requires a suppression of the Syrian air defence system and so on. We will end up, we're, this, we are now on a track which is looking very much like it may end up with military engagement on the ground. Now, then what happens? What happens when a British, a French or an American special forces team is captured inside Syria or killed? We saw the captures happen in Libya like this. Fortunately, it was our side that caught them and their bodies paraded through the streets. Yeah, I mean, what no, no, no one's suggesting it's easy, but are you really suggesting that inaction on Syria is going to lead us to a better result than what you're out outlining? The action should take place on the political field. There is, it needs to be, uh, con consideration needs to be given as to what can be done. What are we trying to achieve and how are we going to achieve it? No one has outlined that, as Christine and Elizabeth have both said. What we need one way or the other is political leadership and a strong political track. Okay, just finally, Christine Ocran, on the political leadership as far as France is concerned, we've only just had an intervention in Mali from the new French president, well, no longer new in power for a year. Does that mean that the appetite somehow or the leadership could still be there? Well, I mean, Mali was uh, seen uh, quite rightly, in my view, as an emergency to prevent the whole uh, sub-Saharian uh, strip to become, uh, you know, to, to fall into the hands of Islam fundamentalists. But of course, French defense is all already overstretched. So it's not so much a question of leadership. I don't think, you know, our leaders are, are not always competing for glory. I think <laughs> they're just trying to make do. Uh, I think it is just amazing that we have lost two years in confronting <coughs> the Syrian issue. But now that these two years have passed and that indeed the human suffering is so huge and the danger for all the neighboring countries, as you pointed out in the beginning, is so enormous, I think we have to do something. And okay. politically, of course, but in order to, to be politically active, we need to talk to our enemies. Absolutely. Yeah. And not enemies to as well ourselves. as our friends. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you very much to you all, Christine Ocran, Frank Ledwidge, and also in Washington, Elizabeth Obagi. Thank you for being with us for this debate.